now. Well, hello, and welcome to the Waking Up Spiritually podcast. This is Wendy Rose Williams, and I'm here with Greg Kirk on the second and fourth Sunday of each month at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. And we're so glad you joined us, whether it's live uh, via Zoom or in the Waking Up Spiritually group on Facebook. You're welcome to join us there. And then we also archive the podcast at the wakingupspiritually.com uh, website so you can find uh, past episodes there. And I'm a past life regression um, adventure guide. My website is my full name, wendyrosewilliams.com. And I help people release energy that does not serve them anymore so that you can live a happy, healthy life filled with purpose and just feel like you're on track. And you can find my books on Amazon and Audible by checking for uh, my full name, Wendy Rose Williams. And I'm really excited for today's topic. And Greg's going to introduce himself now. And also, he's going to go first. And we're each going to share um, an example of today's, today's uh, subject. So thank you for being here. Yeah. So I'm Greg Kirk. You can find me at gregkirk.com. My name is spelled G-R-E-G-G-K-I-R-K. I also run the Lyme Recovery Clinic, that's L-Y-M-E, so I help patients of Lyme disease and other chronic illnesses with physical healings. Uh, I also sell some herbal products as well on that website, but on gregkirk.com, uh, you can reach out to me. That I, I just recently installed it, realized I didn't have it, and uh, make an appointment link at the top of my navigation bar at gregkirk.com, uh, where you can make an appointment with me for an energy session. They can either be in person or over the phone, a remote session. So we get into looking for blocks to your healing, to your spiritual advancement. And also if you feel like you have attachments. So these are negative beings or negative thoughts or negative energies that are around you, please contact me for that. So I also have a book uh, called The Gratitude Curve that I wrote about my experience with Lyme disease and chronic healing and how that helped. Uh, I learned from it, became empowered and helped with my spiritual uh, evolution. So check that yes, out. It's, it's a wonderful book. People should definitely check out The Gratitude Curve because it, it takes a lot of maturity to look at some really tough experiences and say, how do I turn this around? How can I feel grateful for these and just grow through that instead of just going through it? Because a lot of us can be stuck in that place of just going through life. Yeah, exactly. Thank you for Thank you for that uh, endorsement. <laughs> Appreciate it. So um, our subject today is um, gifts from NDE. That's a near-death experience. So uh, Wendy and I discussed this offline earlier in the week of, you know, through uh, messages like what, because, you know, I was getting an idea for a topic. She was too. And we, we kind of combined our ideas, which um, receiving uh, good information um, directions in life, things like that, from a life-threatening experience. So um, the, those tend to be the pivotal moments when you get the best information, when you're close to leaving the earth. Sometimes it, you get information that, you know, while you, I, I wrote a, a line in a song one time, like, uh, while I was dying, I learned how to live. That's, that's really, um, that's what happens. Mm -hmm. So um, I just want to clarify that and, and Wendy, I'm sure we'll get into a lot of details on what a near-death experience is um, and a, a classic NDE. And there, there's some hallmarks of those experiences. And I want to, you know, say right now that mine was not like that. So I did not leave my body. I didn't see a tunnel. I didn't, you know, none, none of that happened during this particular experience. But um, it was a, a life-threatening, almost, you know, death-defying <laughs> death was almost involved. In fact, so just let me get right into it. So I uh, was in the middle of my struggle with Lyme disease and um, I'd gone two years undiagnosed. I, I was having symptoms I didn't understand that were not classic Lyme disease sy symptoms. So even though I live in an area where Lyme disease is very prominent, <clears throat> my doctors didn't think to test me. I didn't think to test me because of my symptoms mainly. So I went two years chasing these gastrointestinal symptoms that I was having. Um, and then finally, it just, it just seemed like a sheer accident, uh, although I know there are no such thing, but uh, a, a naturopath diagnosed me 
based upon my symptoms. So I thought, all right, that's great. I'm, it's Lyme disease, should be able to treat this, no trouble. Well, anybody who knows about Lyme disease realizes that's the beginning of the struggle. And the treatment is a whole other ball of wax. It's a whole other set of confusing things. Um, it's just not a, as simple as a round of antibiotics, which is how this woman approached it. Here, here's some antibiotics, take them. So I did, and I was not better after a couple of weeks. Um, and in fact, when I went in to visit her, I said, you know, she said, how are you doing? And I said, I feel like shit. And she said, good. And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, it shows me that you're having what's called a Herxheimer reaction. It's a reaction to treatment. So it means that the, the treatment is killing the pathogens, the bugs, you know, the bacteria that's bothering you. Their cell bodies are being disrupted and, and they're releasing toxins in your system. So it's a sign that, you know, you're, you're actually, the, the medicine's working and you're killing the infection and you know sooner or later you're going to feel better. Um, there was some truth to what she said. I learned that's when I learned about a Herxheimer reaction but and then she told me to tough it out which is not what I <laughs> help people with. You, you, you don't just let the toxins sit in your system and and tough it out and, and let the natural action of your liver and kidneys take care of take care of business because sometimes the pathogen load is so big and you when you take these medicines, you're, you have what's called a cytokine storm. We're hearing about that with uh, COVID now, where the cytokine storm, which is one of the toxins, the inflammatory causing toxins uh, caused by the die-off reaction, they can shut down your organs. You know, they can interrupt your heartbeat. So they, so anyway, so I, I went through that for a couple of weeks and I thought, that, listen, if this is an infection, and this is the way I was thinking at the time, and it's also my warrior mentality coming through, I thought, if this is an infection, let's treat this as, let's, I want to get disinfected. <laughs> so how, how do I incorporate some Pretty medicine clean. that cleans house on me? What, what do I do? And I found out about something called a PICC line. So P-I-C-C. -C. Uh, it stands for peripheral, in, internal, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. It's, it's, it's basically a line that gets inserted uh, where you can administer your own antibiotics every day. So you you give you yourself your own doses of of IV antibiotics. So I thought IV, you know that that's the that's the antibiotics going straight in. It's systemic. That's the nuclear option I've been looking for. We're just gonna clean house on this pathogen load. It crosses the blood brain barrier. I was having you know neuro, neurological brain problems uh, that that showed up on a, a CT scan. So. I, you know, it was, was going to go to areas that the uh, oral antibiotics couldn't go to. So I thought, fantastic. Did I do any research on it? No, I had no idea. You know, I just thought, all right, they're just going to put this stub in my, in the crook of my arm here. And it's, the line's going to hang out and I'll screw the antibiotics into that. Well, that's actually not what a pick line is. Uh, a pick line goes, they run a lead uh, from, uh, from a vein in your bicep all the way down to your aorta. So it's an operation. So I'm, I'm sitting in the waiting room of this hospital and I just thought, oh, you know, they're gonna come in and pop this thing in my arm. No, 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 they laid me down on the table. They put an X-ray over me and they gave it's me- image guided. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, fluoroscope is what they called it. And, and they were watching, you know, so I was watching this line go in to my heart and everything. And then I just started not feeling well because they jabbed my heart. Okay, so I started having a heart attack on the table and my blood pressure started going down. So I, I hear I'm lying down and I feel like I'm gonna pass out. I'm like, what, why, why? So I started saying something to the people there in the room, like, I'm not feeling well. And then they started getting upset. So my blood pressure dropped and I was having a minor heart attack because it was invaded by this line. So they screwed up and I didn't know it. They didn't tell me. They didn't say anything like, oh, we jabbed your heart. Sorry. Or, you know, no, it was just like, oh, your blood pressure's dropping. Yes. Can I ask a question, Greg? Were you in a physician's office? Were you in, was in a hospital? So I was, in, was a in, hosp in a hospital setting. Hospital. So you're in the imaging department of the hospital. I was actually in an operating room. So oh, that was the other you. shocking. That was the shocking thing about it. I went, no one had told you that that's how this was going to be done. No, no. So I, when I, I made the appointment, I went to a hospital, you know, 
and they and I had an interview with somebody and they said, okay, just go wait over there and we'll call you in. <clears throat> so prior to my um, operation that I didn't know was supposed to be an operation, this guy came in and talked to me. He said, which arm would you like it in? So I just figured he's, he's going to pop something in my arm and and uh, he said, which arm do you use? I said, I use my right arm, so let's do it in my left arm. And he said, oh, that's a little harder because of the way your veins are configured over your chest. And I was like, what? What does that have to do with anything? So never told right. me that this right. was this invasive and, uh, you know, operation. So mm -hmm. when I walked into the operating room, there was four people there and they laid me on a table with an x-ray. And I was like, what is happening here? Mm -hmm. So I, I still didn't know until... The operation started and then, you know, there just wasn't informed consent. There just wasn't a helpful process of informed consent. No. Wow. So it was, it was an oversight um, on their part, on my part for not doing research. I'll take half the blame. I, I didn't look into it, but they did a lousy job of explaining what was going to happen. So, um, you know, I, I told a lot of people that, you know, Lyme disease broke my heart. I mean, <laughs> it literally did. How literal. I mean, you're making me think of Louise Hayes' Heal Your Body book because right. it is so literal. Yeah. 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 So anyway, so that was that was rough. Um, and I didn't get scared until I started feeling weird, you know, lying down. And it was so weird because one of the women next to me was like, Oh, you're not feeling well. Like here, well, maybe this will make you feel better. So she puts the fluoroscope image like screen right in front of me so I can watch what they're doing. And I was, I couldn't, I was like, no, I, I could would have, I would have thrown up. There would have yeah, been no exactly. field at all. <laughs> right. Right. Cause I could, yeah, that's, yeah, that's that not bothered helpful. me. It really bothered me. So I turned my head mm -hmm. and I, and then my blood pressure started going down or whatever. It, uh, numbers, they're reading numbers. They're, they were like, Oh, you know, alarm. This is not good. His blood pressure is diving. Um, so I, I'm not even sure what happened, like why, you know, I, I, I'm, <laughs> who knows, I, that could have taken me out right there, you know, with this, literally this wire going into my heart and it hit my S node, my sinusoid node. So that is actually a nerve center in your heart that is your natural pacemaker. So oh. literally they poked the one spot in my heart that tells my heart to beat on time. Oh my. So I didn't realize that till later, but real quick. So went through that. They put me out in the hallway to monitor me. They gave me lunch. <laughs> so I ate lunch on this gurney out in the hallway. People walking by me in the hospital. I'm like, all right. So, you know, this is me too, not being so smart. They're like, all right, you, you got to get out of here now. I didn't have anybody to pick me up. I'm like, I'll, I'll drive home. Um, actually, I didn't drive home. I drove to another office where they administered my first antibody. Oh, no, no, that didn't happen then. I'm sorry. That didn't happen. Never mind. I, I, so I drove home after having experienced a heart attack. Um, wow. And there was no recovery either. And you were also given food immediately. This is just so yeah. Tough. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's there could have been a lawsuit in there. I, I don't know. But not my point. Yeah. <laughs> I know. But yeah, it was just, it was a very unusual set of uh, procedures or whatever. Right. That you Circumstance. Think, think would be there, but weren't uh, in terms of guiding me through the experience. Um, but yeah, they, they did say come the next day to this other doctor's office. Well, they'll show you how to work the pick line and so forth. So, um, and they'll give me my first dose of antibiotics. So um, anyway, so I went home and I was feeling really wonky. And then, um, so I, you know, I went to bed early that night and, um, that night I, I tend to sleep on my side. So I rolled over on my side and the line went into my heart like worse. Um, and I woke up because my heart was, I was having a, a heart attack <laughs> and that, that was bad. Um, so, um, so what did you do at that point? Did you or right. family members call for yeah. help? What'd you do? You no. Know, so I didn't tell my wife, she, you know, Tracy, she was lying next to me and I thought, I think I might die. So I'm going to go downstairs, you know, and run, like go to the edge of the forest, like a dog and <laughs> die by myself. So I went downstairs on the couch 
and this is like at four in the morning, I just watched the sunrise wondering if I was going to die. The other weird thing is I worked a corporate job. I had a big presentation to give that day um, in, in front of a bunch of vice presidents. I didn't even call into work. I, I didn't. All I did was I waited until 7.30 when that was the time when I could um, reach the emergency line to the hospital. So I called, so a guy answered the phone at 7.30 and, um, and he said, uh, wow, I can't believe what you went through. That's terrible. And he's like, I'm so sorry. But um, he said, I'm going to say something to you that might sound strange, but you know, you went through the worst of it. So can you tough it out? In other words, like, can you, you haven't taken any antibiotics, like the whole reason for you to get this didn't, didn't happen. Like, can you try to take the antibiotics and see if you can do it? So, you know, like an idiot, I'm like, yeah, sure. I'll do that. And I, I did. So I, and I, I just took a nosedive after that. The antibiotics were not what I needed. They were really harsh on my system. Um, maybe brain foggy and just, uh, I felt terrible. And then a couple of weeks, and then I got a C. diff infection within a few weeks, which is- um, C. difficile. C. difficile infection, which it, what happens when you, antibiotics just completely wipe out your you know, intestinal flora. So I was throwing up and having diarrhea at the same time. I couldn't keep fluids down. And then um, later in the week, I had a big argument with my wife and um, I, just my heart started going crazy. Um, and I, I was in a different room in the house. We, we didn't sleep together that night. We were, we were so, I'm so mad at her. She was mad at me. And um, I, I fell asleep face down and my heart just started beating really, really hard. Like I was having like bongo drums, you know, like I had the other night when, you know, I, I rolled over on it. And um, at that point I thought, you know what, this is, I'm done. This is, I'm ready to go. So I, I was welcoming <laughs> myself into the arms of the angels or whatever you want to, because I felt like I was actually dying. I thought I was going to die at that point. So I was willingly accepting that and thinking, all right, I'm ready to go. Um, I kind of did a quick inventory of my life. I thought I've had a good life up to this point and I'm ready, I'm ready to, to be taken. In fact, please take me because I'm looking ahead in my life. I don't really like if my life isn't, you know, has all of this pain and agony and, and um, sickness in, in it, then I don't want it. So, so that was my near death experience where I, I, I had a much stronger heart reaction. That was a heart attack that actually wasn't related to being directly poked. It was later on, it was from the antibiotics and it was my sinusoid. Cause I, I, I finally got a, an EKG done where they, you know, they did a scan of my heart, mm -hmm. electrocardiogram to see if I'd, what kind of damage I'd have. And they said it was just on my sinusoid node. Mm -hmm. So it was that, but so my sinusoid node went nuts and almost stopped my heart from beating. And I was praying, please take me out. And, um, and it didn't happen. So everything calmed down. I fell asleep and, um, and within four days, my life changed, like dramatically. Really? Um, yeah. So Tell I. Tell us more about that. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I met. Uh, I was driving to a um, another doctor's appointment, and, and on the radio, I started hearing a guy. <clears throat> I was I was listening to a talk radio station, and I, and I was um, and they had this energy healer on this talk radio show. So the talk radio show, this is like a, a, the pairing of this guy and, and the, uh, the host didn't make any sense. So, <laughs> I mean, like they were shock jocks, you know, as we used to call them back in the day. And then here they have this energy healer and worker on, and he was getting heckled right and left. These people would call him up and say, ah, you're a big fake. And I don't believe anything you're saying. And then the guy would say, oh, your mother's here with me. And she says, blah, blah, blah. And just taking these people out with the information he was getting from those who had passed on. And I was entertained by this, but what, you know, where my antenna went up was when then the guy was pushing energy through the phone to these people. And I thought, well, who is this guy? He's, he's very interesting. So um, they, at the end of the show, they said, if you want to contact this guy and have a personal session done, you can, and here's the number, blah, blah, blah. 
I don't ever do these kinds of things. I didn't ever do those kinds of things back then. This is four days after I had this you know, near death experience uh, or whatever, life-threatening experience. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I made an appointment with this guy. He was very expensive. He only did a half an hour over the phone. And I actually, at this point, don't even recommend people seeing him because of what happened after this, but it was definitely a divine situation mm -hmm. as he noticed. So he, mm -hmm. we started almost an hour and a half late because the way he set up his sessions was everybody had half an hour, but he always went over. So, mm. you know, if he went over the first session, it rippled throughout more the more and more late domino effect. He was an hour and a half late or something. It was, so I was getting a little upset. And then, uh, but he, anyway, he did the session over the phone. It was very powerful. Uh, the depression I had went away. He um, wow. removed all these, these entities. He said I had hundreds of entities attached to me. And then, you know, in the middle of the session, I heard him talking. So he's talking to me and he's talking to my guides and, and my guide said something to him and he said it out loud that, you know, he's more special than you know, is what he said out loud to me. I said, who are you talking to? He said, your guides are telling me that you're more special than I know and that you're going to write a book and you're going to be doing what I'm doing. And I was like, what? You know, so I say, what was your reaction? What year was this, Greg, roughly? This was 2007. 2000. So this was a big no. surprise uh, 14 years ago. It meant nothing to me. Uh -huh. it, no, I mean, I, I mean, I, I was, I didn't care what he said. That part, I was like, oh, whatever. <laughs> he also told me I was from the planet Maldek, which back then I was like, what are you talking so about? Just none of it thing. landed with you at that time. None of it landed. That's a very good way of putting it. None <laughs> of it landed. The only part that landed was how I was physically reacting to the session. Mm -hmm. So my vision was changing. Like I, it was, my vision was so dark back then that it just, the clouds lifted and I felt different. Wow. Like the, the two years of depression depression just evaporated. Say, how of symbolic of depression. Yes. So it, it all went away. And then, then, you know, it was only until the end, I said, so what, what are you telling me? I'm going to write a book and I'm going to do this stuff. And he said, yeah, he said, you're on the, on the, you're going to fight the good fight. You're on the good team. You're, you know, I'm going to help you. Um, and that's where things started to go south because he was an unreliable guy. And we did schedule another session like about three months later and he, he showed up to it drunk. <laughs> and, oh dear. Yeah. We're, we're, and we're it, done with this one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So he, did, but, but he actually said during the session, he said, listen, um, you know, there's no ego involved in this, but I, it was, I was the only one who was going to do that, who could do this for you. And this is divine timing and this is going to happen, et cetera, et cetera. He said, but you're going to meet more healers. And then four days after I met him, I met, <laughs> The right person to help me carry on. Um, this person was also involved in healing and helped me within a week of meeting this person, this woman, I was starting to do the energy work. You know, she Maybe threw you me in the water. The contrast between the two. Maybe you wouldn't have started working with her. Oh, right. Yeah. It, no, no. It, I mean, it it all lined up so in such perfection. It was, it was uncanny. Um, but yeah, so she was because she saw my energy, you know, and she, this is the other thing I knew she was for real. She, she saw my energy before I even met her. <laughs> so she's like, I didn't know who you were, but you showed up during my meditation the day before we met. And she said, I didn't want to say anything to you, but you know, you were asking for help. I was like, wow. Um, but you know, so she had seen my energy and, and she confirmed a lot of the things that this guy said. He, she's like, you, and you know, to this day, I think she's one of the most amazing healers I've ever met. And she's like, oh, you're beyond me. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I don't even know what I, I haven't even, like I learned Reiki and that's it. You know, at that point, I, that's all I'd ever done. I'm like, I'm just this half-ass Reiki guy, <laughs> you know, but she's like, oh no, you don't know. And, and so, you know, it, things started off by her saying, um, hey, you know, I'm going to be doing a remote session on my uncle who's very sick with cancer. Why don't you join the session? I'm like, what are you talking about? She's like, you know, just, and she gave me a couple of tips, you know, but you know, it's like they'll throw, throw you in the water to teach you how to swim. She at least told me how, like, you know, here's some strokes you might want to try, <laughs> you know, in other words, she would say, you know, visualize uh, the person's face, blah, blah, blah. But it was just very rudimentary and, and very open. And, and I, within, a week I started to, it was, it, it was amazing. Just that, that strange, very simple guidance that was very hands-off, 
very hands up. It was, I didn't believe it that I would even have the ability to do it. And she somehow knew I did. And um, just gave me a couple of like verbal tips and then fireworks, you know, it was, it was amazing. So Sometimes we just need that nudge or that reminder because everything's been all lining up and we didn't know it. And it's like someone helps push our on switch. It's yep. our innate abilities. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. So, but plus I think she, she had a, a clear vision of, you know, what, um, could see what I could do or what that I couldn't. So, uh, anyway, so that was pretty much how are you so, meant to serve? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, there I went within, you know, from praying to die to helping other people, uh, <laughs> within a matter of weeks. And, um, you know, it just, it just got better and better after that. So, um, anyway, so that's, that's my story. And, um, Wendy, I will hand it over to you. Okay. Well, that's amazing, Greg. Thank you for sharing that. I had to turn off my background because I was just feeling it so much. It was just uh, throwing my background off. I had to, had to take it down. Um, yeah. What happened for me was in August of 1997, I was newly pregnant, 10 weeks pregnant, and just thrilled. Um, my husband and I had gone through years of infertility. We did have an 18-month-old at the time. Um, and we'd, there'd all, I'd also had two ectopic pregnancies. So there just, just was a lot of joy um, in, this, in this pregnancy. And, but what was, it, it felt really different than the first one. And I just was having so much heartburn, which just seemed really odd because when you think about being 10 weeks pregnant, I mean, <laughs> the, the fetus is just such a tiny, tiny, tiny um, little, little thing at that time. I was like, what's with all this heartburn? So I'd been to the doctors once and said, everything's looking good. And, but I just didn't feel right. So I'd called them several times and they said, just take my Lanta. You know, my Lanta is perfectly safe um, while, you're, while you're pregnant. And, you know, we'll see you at your next, we'll see you at your next visit. But I was also having precognitive dreams, but I didn't know what precognitive dreams were. I didn't know you could have like a warning type dream that was trying to clue you into something that was going to be an issue. And almost every night I was dreaming about these just violent uh, um, storms at sea. And I would see this big ship, multi-masts, all the masts would just rip off and come out of it. There was all this ripping and tearing. And even the, the winches, the cleats would even rip off the ship and it would break into and it would go down under the water. And I was like, what's with this dream? Because I didn't usually remember any of my dreams at that time. So that, that was also odd. And um, I was working at home um, and I uh, didn't have a car because you know, once my husband's got one at work and our, our nanny was at the park with our daughter. So I'm working, but I just can't get comfortable. So it's like, I'm trying to focus, I'm trying to work, but then I go lay down and then I wander in the bathroom again because I just felt like, I felt like I was coming apart and I just had this sense of impending doom, which I'd never had before or since, just did not make sense to me. And I'm in the bathroom again and I feel this just searing pain in my abdomen. And I literally looked down because I'm like, oh my God, how did somebody stick a knife in me? Because it was just searing. And I passed out on the floor and I came to just curled up in this fetal position because there was so much pain. And I only came to because someone kept calling my name just very insistent. And there was this male voice just saying, Wendy, wake up, Wendy, wake up. And he just would not stop bugging me. <laughs> so I came back um, to consciousness, thankfully. And I looked around in the bathroom and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is incredible because there were just these huge, it was so lit up. There were just these huge rays of light. And I didn't see the angels. I'm not especially clairvoyant and I certainly wasn't then, but I just heard and I knew, I immediately like, oh my gosh, my bathroom's filled with angels. <laughs> this is amazing. 
And one of the um, male, male angels said to me again, you know, very, very clearly, you need to call for help now, or you're going to go home. And I knew exactly what he meant that I was going to die. So I told him, I, I understand, but I, I can't walk. I can't get to the phone. And he said, all you have to do is, is be willing to try and then we can help you. So I managed to get up on my hands and knees. And from there, it was so easy. It was like being lifted. I felt like I was a couple inches off the floor and they just whooshed me over to the phone, which wasn't far away in the master bedroom. I'd been right in the master bathroom and there was, my landline was on my nightstand. Um, so I like you, Greg, don't call 911. What a fascinating <laughs> time. Neither of us calls 911. I call my husband at work and which, <laughs> made, which made some sense because he's got the car. He's five minutes from home. His office was very close to home okay. yeah. and miracles continue. I get him immediately on the phone. I have never reached him at work. Never, ever, ever. And get him on the phone. And I just said, I need you to come home right now. I need you to drive me to the hospital now. And uh, bless him because he didn't say anything other than I'll be right there. He didn't ask me any questions. He just immediately acted, which I really, really think uh, helped save my life as did, as did the angels. And I had just enough time to call the OBGYN office and they were wonderfully specific. And they said, great, um, you know, as soon as you get here, tell your husband, don't park the car and just call us and let us know you're there. And we will come right down and meet you with a wheelchair. We don't want you to walk. So, okay, fine. So I was there faster than, than an ambulance could have, could have gotten me there. I'm there in 15 minutes, but of course I don't have any medical aid on the way. So we get to, the, get to the OB's office. Thankfully, again, the OB office is at the hospital. And I wouldn't be telling you this story, I don't think, otherwise either. Uh, so they wheel me into the ultrasound room and the ultrasonographer uh, tries to, uh, to do, you know, take a look at my abdomen. And my abdomen is just getting visibly bigger by the minute, which just makes no sense. You can see it really distending. And none of us were thinking miscarriage because I'm not, I'm not bleeding. Um, I'm not, I'm not bleeding vaginally, but my abdomen is just going up and up and up. And so, you know, I think internal and, bleeding, That's right. Cool. Internal bleeding. And also I felt, you know, I felt the organ tear, which I really think was that ship going down. I think that was just trying to warn me, hey, you need to pay attention. Your ship's going to go down here. And it was all that, you know, ripping and tearing in the, in the dreams. And so they tried to do an ultrasound, but they can't see a darn thing. It's just black. And I kind of looked at her and I'm like, is that thing on? <laughs> is your machine working? Because I'd had ultrasounds before and I knew you could see organs and you could see different things. And she just, she kept a good game face on and she said, I'll be right back with the doctor. And she went out of the room and my husband and I are just kind of looking at each other. And I heard her break into a run as soon as she was out of, out of the room. And she came right back with uh, OBGYN physician and with a nurse midwife. And they took one look at the screen and the doctor said, we're admitting you now. We need to take you up on the floors. I said, okay, I get it. And they went and got a stretcher because they didn't even want me in the wheelchair. And I get admitted um, immediately into the hospital. And they you know, get me as comfortable as they can in the bed. And they try and get blood. They ask me my blood type. Luckily, I know it. So you know, we skip all those. I'll skip all those steps of getting matched. And they take my um, you know, word for it. And I'm sure they're checking my hospital records too because I had a baby there 18 months earlier. So I said, OK, I'm A negative. And I can hear them calling for blood. I can hear the nurse out at the nurse's station. And I also noticed they put me in the room next to the nurse's station, which I knew wasn't a great sign either that they were really concerned with what was going on. Yeah. And she comes back in and says, well, there's gonna be a delay in getting the blood um, because evidently there was a big train accident um, in Seattle like two or three days before 
and it had really, um, we have a central um, blood supply system here. Every hospital doesn't have its own blood. We get it from a, a central blood bank. Um, and so it wasn't like you could call around to other hospitals when the blood bank tells you they're, they're out of blood, they're out of blood. Um, anyway, so there was a delay in getting the blood, but they do get it at a certain point and they hang the bag and it is so uncomfortable. I mean, I've had IVs before, but I am just whining and crying and fussing and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, I don't want to say stoic, but I, I can hold it together pretty well. I know how to, you know, try and relax and just, just work with whatever, but I just, it was so painful. And I think because they were trying, you know, had the valve like wide open because they're really trying to get blood on board because I needed a lot of blood. Um, and the doctor wants to do surgery and I'm looking at him like, for what? What are you operating on? What are we doing? What's the plan? What kind of surgeon should we have? I'm like just being honestly stubborn and resistant because I'm so I haven't had time to like catch up to what's going on because it's all happening really fast and and just because they couldn't you know they just couldn't get a good visual so what they don't know what's actually happened is my uh, uterus had ruptured and specifically the fundus f-u-n-d-u-s at the top of the uterus and that's an aorta so that's why I am just massively um, losing, losing blood. So we agree, okay, let's give, it, let's give it a little bit of time. We've got some you know, blood products going on board now. Let's give it a little bit of time. I can't get out of bed even to go to the bathroom. I just need to lie flat. And they're trying to see, can, can, you know, can this, whatever it is, repair itself um, in some way? Because I don't want surgery. Um, and this went on for um, a couple days, but my hematocrit just kept going down and down and down. And I just, um, I couldn't focus. I just kept falling asleep. I'm like tuning out. I'm just really walking between worlds is the best way I can describe it. And I think it was the third day um, I agreed and the doctor said, you know, Wendy, let's call a spade a spade. You, you're bleeding out. We can't get enough blood on board here fast enough. We just can't pump it in and you're still losing it clearly, um, you know, based on your hematocrit and based on your belly. Because um, by now I'm looking like four or five months pregnant. I mean, there's a huge abdominal bleed. So I agree to the surgery. And uh, my, my poor doctor, he's like, I'm getting more gray hair by the day. <laughs> we need to do surgery. And I was very comfortable with him. I knew he was an excellent, excellent surgeon. Um, he had taken care of both my ectopic pregnancies. And I just, I just knew um, by experience and reputation. And he was going to do the surgery with one of his fellow OBGYN physicians. And that made the most sense because um, I was pregnant. So we said, okay, that's what we'll do. I get scheduled for the next morning as the first surgery of the day. And the night before the surgery, um, you know, I have dinner. Yeah, you get it super early. It's the hospital. And I'm just trying to relax. I'm just trying to build up my strength to go through and, and I'm trying to visualize having a successful surgery the next day. I'm trying to visualize feeling better. The minute I do that, I pop out of my body and I leave my body. And I just see myself, um, I can feel myself like floating up away from my body. Oh my God, I feel fantastic. There's no more pain. I don't feel too small anymore. I just feel so much better. And I look down at my body in the hospital bed and I had some numerous moments and I looked down and I'm like, wow, she's whiter than the sheets. She really looks like hell. I'm <laughs> just like very disassociated. And I know it's me, but I also know it's not really me. It's just, it's just a body. And I also look and I'm like, oh my gosh, couldn't they have at least brushed her hair? Because I, of course, just look like a wild woman because it's been, you know, four days in bed and we haven't exactly been um, um, doing grooming here. 
<laughs> and I kind of, I kind of laughed about that too. And I'm like, oh, well, whatever. And I noticed I was referring to myself as she. And that concerned me a little bit because I knew I was pretty darn disassociated. I really, I really didn't care very much about that body in the bed. I just wanted to explore and just kept feeling, you know, better and better and better. So I float up through the ceiling of the hospital room. And the minute I do that, I'm outside and I can see all this light up above, like I did in my bathroom only a million times more. And I'm like, oh, well, that's it. That's the light. That's home. I'm going. And then I must have heard, I wasn't very familiar. I was not spiritually awake at the time. This is 1997. Uh, but I must have heard enough about uh, near-death experiences or seen something in a movie to know people typically or often went through a tunnel. And I remember thinking, oh, please don't give me one of those long dang tunnels. I am exhausted. I don't want to walk through uh, this long tunnel. And the minute I thought that, this beautiful, pristine escalator came in. And I could see this escalator just for me. No one else on it. And it just goes up and up and up. So I get on it and I notice in pure soul form, I'm like a white beach ball, but it's like a little lightning storm. There's like all this energy moving in it, but I can, that was my soul. And that's how I appeared to myself in pure soul form. But I could also see, I looked kind of deflated. And so I like leaned on the railing of the escalator. I was kind of like, oh, great, I can rest here. So the escalator takes me up and up and up. And at the top of the escalator, there is the best welcome home party. And there's like 20 beings of light. I have only come one step off that escalator and they're already there waiting. Some more come rushing in, but they were already there waiting. There's about 20 of them. And it was some of the angels that had been in the bathroom. It was all my grandparents, which was super cool because I really was close to my mom's parents. We had lived with them. They'd been a big part of my life. I recognized them. They passed on. So they're there. And my dad's parents were there, which was super cool because I never got to meet them because they died um, before I was born. But I knew exactly who they were. And there were some animals, you know, uh, pets that we'd had. And it just was so awesome. So they give me this huge, huge group hug from everybody. And I was like, oh my gosh, I just want to stay forever. Because it was that unconditional love of home and just no judgment and like everything is right. And we don't get to experience unconditional love like that very often. Um, often on earth, it's conditional. Um, so that was amazing. And the same um, male angel um, started talking to me because I'm like, I'm like, I'm like a little kid in some ways. I'm like trying to like jump and like look over their shoulders and I like want to go further. And they're kind of holding me back. They're definitely holding me back right there at the top of the escalator. And the male angel says, welcome home. We're so glad you're here. Just enjoy this. You've done nothing wrong, but we want you to understand you need to make a choice and you have to make it now or you're not going to be able to go back to your body. So listen to me well. And what I want you to know is if you go back to your body, you will have a successful surgery tomorrow. You will recover fully and your baby will be born healthy. We want you to know that. But you also need to know life is going to be very difficult, probably for years to come because you're not on your life path. You're not living your life purpose. So of course, I'm like aghast to hear this. I'm just really horrified and ask them, well, what, what do I need to be doing? I'm, 36 years old, I want to be doing the right thing. I want to be a good person. I want to do what I came here to do. What is it? If I don't know it yet, and I'm now home, can you please tell me? And he just shook his head just really gently. 
And I looked around at the others. And I thought maybe someone else will give. <laughs> I look around at the others and they just start being silly, which just made me laugh. And it's like bringing me more energy and raising my vibration. And some of them were like putting like duct tape over their mouths and like rolling their eyes and being dramatic. And some of them were like, throwing the key away, you know, they've locked their, <laughs> they're just, they're not going to tell me. I'm obviously not going to, I'm not supposed to know. So I, it didn't take me any time at all to make the decision. It's like, okay, I can go back. I will be healthy. I can have my baby. And immediately when he'd asked me the question, do you want to go back? I just pictured our toddler's face. And she was the most, of course, every parent thinks this, she's the most adorable toddler. And she had these huge eyes and this like brown curly hair. And I just saw her face, just saw that. And I said, I'm going back. Um, I, I, I want to go back, please. Yeah, I want to go back. And I felt so respected that I got to make the choice because a lot of the ND literature and, and um experiences people share they say that they were shoved back pushed back you know it just kicked back just something you know pretty harsh um <laughs> happens to you know make them go back to their body but i was given a very clear choice and and i took it so before i went they gave me one more huge hug and i realized that time it wasn't just love it was energy because I was below empty on the gas tanks. I've been bleeding out for days. And I think just realizing and being told so specifically you're not living your life purpose, that really took me aback and shocked me because uh, I still didn't know what it was. So they just spin me around and everybody's like waving goodbye and sending me back down the escalator. And I just went really gently into my body. And I did have a successful surgery the next day. Um, they had never done the surgery before. They couldn't even um, find many cases of this in the literature. They said this happens maybe one in 15,000 times, cases of pregnancy, but that, that the math didn't even make sense because the hospital I was in, they did about 5,000 births a year. And both the OBs who were probably in their 50s at the time, they're both like, we've never seen this. We've never dealt with this. We've been you know, calling all over, trying to get some information to, to help you and to help your case. And there had been some brief discussion of, you know, do you want to go downtown? Do we send you to the teaching hospital? And I was like, no, I, I belong right here and, and you guys can do it. Um, so I recovered in the hospital for a couple days um, and went home uh, quite a few uh, quarts low, <laughs> literally because they had not been able to um, transfuse enough blood. So it was six, six weeks bed rest at home, essentially. Um, and we were very, very fortunate um, that we had the nanny because she was able to um, you know, help, help me too and, and take care of our, our toddler because I certainly could not have done it. And what happened um, then, so I recover, I go back to work and I go back um, part-time just for a week and then I go back full-time and it was a job I loved. I'd been there maybe three years and glowing performance evaluations. But all of a sudden, about six weeks after I'm back to work, I get um, called into my boss's office and uh, HR is sitting there. And they said, you know, sit down. We've got um, something really hard to tell you. And we're laying you off. So I'm laid off. And we're not only now without my income, which the family certainly needed, but I carry the health insurance for the entire family. So we have no health insurance. And guess what? I'm pregnant. And I am also honestly not fully recovered. And I'm not in a good headspace either because we're worrying about, is the baby gonna be healthy? You know, I've had surgery, I've had morphine, I've had blood transfusions just everything you don't want going on during a pregnancy. And also knowing that the top of my uterus had been stitched up, now we're gonna go through all the growth of the pregnancy and is it going to burst again, either during pregnancy or when I deliver. So this is on my mind, this is on my shoulders. And you know, there's just no way to um, you know, really alleviate that. So, I'm now home and I apply for unemployment. I'm job searching, um, but that's kind of an exercise in futility. 
And one week to the day after I get laid off, my husband comes home and he was really late that night. And just the way he walked in the door, I thought, oh, shit. I'd just never seen him so dejected. And he walked in and I said, you know, what's wrong? And he said, I've got something really hard to tell you. Uh, said, okay, go ahead. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm ready because I already kind of knew. And he said, we had to do massive layoffs today. Um, most of the company is gone. Um, and I've just moved to Payless Paydays as one of the five owners of the software firm. And we are going to be working harder than ever because we've got to fulfill the contracts that we've already been paid for. And we need to try and sell the company. And I'm still back on payless payday. I'm like, what's a payless payday? I don't know what that term is. And I don't like it. <laughs> because what can be worse than, you know, not being paid in your full-time employment? You know, it's just, it's just crazy. I'm really not wrapping my head around it. So I'm like, okay, well, at least you can apply for unemployment and we'll have a little bit more. He's like, no, I don't qualify. I'm self-employed. We didn't, we didn't pay the insurance for it. We chose not to do it. And I'm like, wow. And that was never discussed with me. How interesting. Um, so uh, things got very, very hard. And uh, he's off at work literally 80 to 100 hours a week. I'm trying to keep it together at home. We have to um, keep our nanny because she was on a contract. There was no, it wasn't an at will thing. She had a year a year contract and honestly we needed her. Um, so um, she remained with us. We had purchased a new home and we'd purchased a minivan recently getting ready for the, the second baby. When our car died, we decided, okay, let's do the unstylish minivan because it'll be, it'll be practical. So we had some serious bills to pay and just did not have um, income coming in beyond my unemployment. And things were just really, really tough. And uh, I decided, okay, best thing to do is contact the lenders for both the house and for the car and see if I can make some partial payments, see if we can delay anything, just let them know what's going on. We both have MBA degrees. We both have had great careers. We're both looking for new employment. Um, but just see if I can negotiate a little bit of wiggle room because I didn't want to just passively sit and wait and, you know, get into problems with potential foreclosure or repossession. So what happened, um, both of them um, said to me, thanks for the heads up. We're going to go ahead and initiate foreclosure now and we're going to initiate repossession now. And I'm like, Wow that angel was right. Things are going to get really, really hard. So um, we were doing everything reasonable. You know, we'd cut costs. I, I was looking for a part-time job, you know, instead of a full-time job, uh, you know, we're just doing everything we can, um, but things are just not going well. So a um, lot, lot of prayer involved in just trying to, you know, put one, one foot in front of the other of, okay, we're just going to get through this and figure this out. And you know, happier, better days are ahead. And we did go to, um, we did have to go to Bank of Mom, um, as I lovingly call it, and my mother helped us. And we were very fortunate um, that she helped us for four or five months. And we were able to keep our home um, and able to keep our, our van and not have those, you know, huge, huge losses of what you've already invested into those, as well as where were we gonna be living and what were we gonna be driving? Um, so very, very grateful that um, my mother helped us. And I then um, went on and, and had um, a successful, um, you know, safe, safe delivery. I was very fortunate. And um, they decided to induce about a week early because they were afraid the baby was getting really big. And my first daughter had been big. And they actually added a full-time nurse to the schedule just for me. And that's unheard of. It's like hospitals don't do that. And I was really, really grateful for that, but they were concerned enough. And again, there was a discussion, should you be delivering downtown? Um, but I went, I went back to my, my local, local hospital. And 
came home um, a, a day later. In those days, it was what, what we kind of call a drive-through delivery of you were given 24 hours from, um, from when you first arrived at the hospital. And it's like, well, gosh, you can like be laboring for 12 hours, but it was a 24 hour stay. So you're in and you're out pretty, pretty darn, pretty darn quickly. And um, I was concerned when I got home because um, the baby's just, you know, she's beautiful, she's healthy. Uh, she's eight pounds, seven ounces. Um, she's just, she's just doing great, but I was, I was nursing her um, the day after she was born, and I, I heard, um, I just heard a, a voice say, your contract with your husband's complete. Um, the two of you are done. And I'm like, what, what? I don't like that at all. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I, I resisted that information for um, a, good, a good five years. And we just, we, just did, we, just did our, we just did our best to be good parents, to be kind to one another. Um, but I was done. I was just done. Um, and, you know, kind of like life, life went on from there. And we did get divorced when the kids were six and eight, waited until they were both in school full time, um, because that was just easier to do a residential schedule where they were going back and forth between the two, two homes. It's easier to have them be old enough that they were in school full time. And we divorced. And then it wasn't until 2020, uh, 10, it was about six years after the divorce that I met um, the man with the contract to wake me up spiritually. And then I started getting on my life path 10 years ago. So that's, that's what happened with the NDE. But I just felt, I felt so grateful to be given that choice to come back. And I also felt for the first time that I really had love and support and wisdom from the other side. And I'd never known how to tap into that. I'd always wanted it, but I'd never known how to tap into it. And I didn't do it until, you know, many, many years after the NDE. But NDEs, you don't forget them. They just fill in. They continue to teach you. It's the same with spiritually transformative experiences. And it's the same with life-threatening, like, like Greg described. Or you can have such a bad fright that something can be take the place of an NDE. Like if you've ever been um, in a car collision and you like see it coming and everything slows down, that can be another example. And I think these are all also exit points. We can choose to take these exit points. So turn it back over to you, Greg. Do, do you feel like that was an exit point you chose not to take with what you described? I was trying to take it. <laughs> I know, I, but evidently, I think you, you physically, your body, your ego were trying to take it, but your soul was like, mm, no, sorry, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> you got yeah. good stuff coming up. <laughs> I was being rejected from the spiritual side, for sure. Right, right, because you had such wonderful things coming up, but you didn't know that yet. Yeah, and literally days later. So it was a very right. pivotal moment. Three yes. Days. And then I got that you know, energy session over the phone right. and, and right. four days after that, another, you know, another situation. And sure. then, yeah, so I was snapped right on my path, like within a week. Right. Which, exactly. Pretty, honestly, I'm just realizing it now within a week, my life completely changed. Well, but I think take, you, it sounds like you went from your lowest low and then started climbing, climbing the mountain from there. Yeah. Yeah. It was de definitely, but it did take some time um, to, uh, you know, for some things to shake out. So I, I, uh, I was in a corporate job at the time and I knew I, it, I wasn't vibing with, you know, I wasn't meshing with the energy there and it took some time for me to, to get out of that situation. So I, I did have the, the layoff experience that you experienced, but, you know, years and years later, um, and that was, uh, that was actually another pivotal, pivotal moment to, to put me in my faith and just start doing what I'm doing now, which is, you know, I'm helping people every day. I'm helping people with their health and energy healing. And that, you know, talk about life path, that's, that feels a lot more comfortable than um, helping rich guys get rich <laughs> at my corporate job, sure. helping rich guys get richer, you know? Sure. So, sure. um, 
Yeah, and, so what were we gonna say? Uh, and I feel that my life path is to help people wake up spiritually. So I think that's where the past life regression work comes in. I think that's where the writing comes in. I think that's where the speaking comes in. But I wasn't, I wasn't ready for that as of the time of the NDE. I still needed to really be a mother. I still needed to um, you know, work, work in industry. And I don't have any regrets for any of that. I worked in healthcare for 30 years. And I primarily worked for hospitals and uh, different types of healthcare organizations. So I think it just, you know, kind of came around for me full circle in a different way. Awesome. Great. Are there any questions? Is there anything on um, either the, the Zoom chat or the Facebook that we can answer real time about NDEs or getting on your path? Because sometimes evidently we need the, we need the boot in the butt. <laughs> we, need, we, need the, we need these strong assists. Right. Um, nothing, just hellos from okay. people okay. saying okay. hi Wonderful. and uh, no, no questions, but um, okay. we can always answer them later. You know, people Absolutely. can, we get a lot of views after the fact, after the Absolutely. broadcast. So we, yeah. can, we can continue answering uh, questions on the uh, the chat that appears below yes. on Facebook. Oh, there's a new yes. notification. So we're, oh, it wasn't, <laughs> sorry, it was a different. Okay. And I'm, I'm noticing um, sessions are changing, the past life regression healing sessions that I do with people are changing. And it's just, there's so much heart healing coming in for people and just amazing, amazing things happening. So I want to encourage anyone that would like to learn more please request a complimentary 15 minute phone appointment with me at my website, which is wendyrosewilliams.com. And we can just have a one-on-one -on -one conversation how I might be of service to you and highly recommend um, sessions with Greg. I've had many of the half hour phone sessions and they're very powerful and it can really help. Uh, you know, even if you're a healer, even if you're a psychic, because just having someone help you hold the energy and help you put the pieces together um, it's just really, um, it's really uplifting and can really, really help. Thank you for saying that. I, I'm, um, and likewise to you, I wrote about my session with you in my book. Uh, oh, yeah. that's right. Yeah, there's a chapter in, in Greg's book about having um, his past life regression and all the powerful things that came through. And it was a session we did together. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, maybe, you know, that's, uh, and actually, so you're, you're noticing the, uh, details of the sessions are, are changing for you and I'm noticing the same and we're starting to get some really interesting information coming through uh, just prior earlier today I, I run an online group healing circle and the information that came through today was just um, unbelievable it, um, so it's a lot of words of wisdom coming in it's very timely and um, you know maybe that that's something we could that'll lead into our next our next podcast some of that because some of it's um, mystery school, some of it's channeled information. It's just because earth and mankind are just up leveling um, at this point, you know, it's just the time when it's coming through more easily. So I look forward to having that topic next time, Greg. Awesome. All right, well, we're at the top of the hour. We've talked for an hour about some life-changing things today. So um, again, if you have any questions, Feel free to ask them on in the Facebook chat or also on our website at um, wakingupspiritually.com. Click the broadcast link. You can actually make comments uh, on that website that we respond to as well. So you yes, can catch, perfect. catch me at gregkirk.com. You can uh, catch Wendy. Over to you, Wendy. Yes. So and my website again is wendyrosewilliams.com. So thanks everyone for being here. We really appreciate it and look forward to connecting with you next time.